Hello everyone and welcome to Werven's World and welcome to my how to play Leaving Earth. Leaving Earth is a new board game from 2015 designed by Joseph Fetchler and published by the Luminaris Group. At the moment it's quite hard to get uh, but I will post some links of at least some web shops at least in Europe that still have it and that's also where I got my copy from but I will be recording at a tabletop simulator because I don't have any fancy recording equipment at home myself nor do I really have the space to set up cameras so uh, with tabletop simulator I'll be able to explain it so what is the game about well the game is about the space race it plays from 1956 to 1976 and you basically want to be the first person or first country to really uh, accomplish some goals for example putting a man on the moon or taking some samples back from mars to earth the problem is you are in a race and you want to be the first person to do it which means you don't have as much time for actually testing your equipment so the game is very much about planning and about managing risk because if you don't test your equipment you run the risk of stuff exploding and maybe even people dying but maybe you also can be the first one to do this these things and get all the glory so it's very much about managing these risks that make this game fun it's quite a thinky game there's quite a lot of math involved it's not very hard math but still math and um, yeah so let's dive into it so you can see how it works before we dive into the rules though, let's first look at the components, because of course if you fire it up in Tabletop Simulator you will immediately see the entire game, but if you take it out of the box you have to set it up yourself. So let's assume you're taking it out of the box. We do have Space Agency cards, and those are basically cards for each player, and they're completely identical except for the flavor on which country you would be. For example, you can be USA, USSR, Japan, China and France. And each country comes with four spacecraft cards. Those spacecraft correspond to tokens you have, but they're not restrictive. If you run out of spaceships, you can use other tokens or whatever. You can build 20 ships if you want to, as long as you have some way of keeping track of them. But in general, four should be enough. Then we've got the mission cards, and mission cards give you missions of what you should do for the points to win the game. For example, here's a mission to get a working probe or capsule into space. You only get one point for that, so that's not very hard. But once we get to the harder missions, you can see here, put a man on Venus and bring him back, and then you get 32 points. So these hard missions are actually very hard, which is good. Um, if you buy the box nowadays, there's also the Mercury expansion in there. I now assume that we play without the Mercury expansion, otherwise there will be some extra locations here. Um, so then we have the location cards, which will be, well, you have to put them up like this. So you have Earth, suborbital flight, and then there's here the moon and lunar orbit. It's kind of like a puzzle. You'll very easily find out where to put everything. And if you don't know exactly, for example, where to put Ceres, well, you can see here there is a direction that says Ceres is that way. So then you put Ceres there. All right. So now we've set that up. While setting up the game, you will notice you will have multiples of some cards, and those are the cards with basically a icon under uh, the name, like Mars and Phobos and Ceres and Venus here, Moon and Suborbital Flight, as well as Solar Radiation. The reason why there's multiples of is that these are unexplored locations and throughout the game you will explore these and you will find out what happens. But these things will differ between games, so that adds to the replayability. For example, one game there might actually be life on the moon and the other time actually everyone will die when you go on the moon or whatever. So that adds to the replayability, so you just choose one and leave the rest in the box. Then we can go to the money pile. You have money, paper money in the game, which is 1, 2, 5, 10 or 20 million. Then we've got some samples, uh, those you can bring back from different planets. We've got supplies that we need to feed the astronauts while they're in space. Then we've got four different rockets that we can use to propel our capsules and astronauts into space. So we've got probe, then we've got some capsules, and we also have an ion thruster, which is kind of a different kind of rocket. Then we've got different astronauts some of them are pilots some of them are mechanics and some of them are medics uh, so these are the pilots and those are the mechanics sorry you can see that by the icon in the top uh, top right and then we've got these research cards here these advancement cards they're called in the game where you want to use for example a saturn rocket well then we first have to actually start testing it so if you want to build saturn rockets you first need to buy this card but we'll go into that later basically for each technology technology for each thing you can do you can buy an advancement card for example for re-entry for landing for rendezvousing but also for each of the rockets 
Then there are the success and failure cards that look like this. There's also some other ones in there, um, failure and major failure. So those will determine how your experiments are going. And we will shuffle those at the beginning of the game. And then there are some time tokens and those you can put on your spacecraft to denote time because well if you are flying from let's say from earth to mars you can't do that in one year so we need to make sure that we put that down as how long it takes and those are the components so let's get into how we play the game so I will explain everything from a solo game perspective and normally they would then recommend to play a hard or very hard game to have kind of a satisfactory game experience but today we will just set up a normal game uh, for easy reference. So for a normal game we need four easy cards. Oh let's shuffle these first actually. We need four easy cards, two, three, four and two medium cards. And then we will lay these out and those will be the missions that will be available for this game. So, whoa, this is actually a Mercury survey. That's a Mercury card. We don't want that. I didn't take those out yet. Then, so we need to have a man in space at the start of a year. So basically we make a space station. We want to bring a man to the moon and back. We want to have a working probe in space, which is a very easy mission. We want to reveal Mars location, so that means we survey Mars. Then we want to bring a man to space and back, which is quite easy, only gives two points. And then we want to reveal the moon location, which means we need to survey the moon. So how will we do that? Before we go into the actual rules of how to play the game, we should dig into some of the mechanics. There's two very, very important mechanics, which are components and maneuvering. So let's first look into maneuvering. We have a nice spaceship here and it's currently in lunar orbit. And from lunar orbit, you can only go to Earth orbit or you can go to the moon. It's easier to go to the moon because that has a difficulty level of two. The number that you see represents the difficulty level. Earth orbit has a difficulty level of three. So let's say we would want to go to the moon from lunar orbit. How would we do that? Well, first then we have to know a very, very important rule for this game. And that is that mass times difficulty equals the thrust we need to get to a certain place. So let's calculate that. We will go to the moon. It has a difficulty of two. We have a probe and a Juno rocket in this spaceship. And that has a combined weight of two because here this scale here is the weight. So we have one plus one is two. The difficulty is two. So mass times difficulty is four. Two times two is four. And we actually have a thrust of four because the Juno rocket gives us a thrust of four. So that is perfect. So basically what we could do is we could move to the moon, we could discard this rocket because now we've used it, you can only use them once, and then the probe is on the moon. Of course it still has to land and all that stuff, but at least now we're in this location. So let's say we wanted to go the other way. Let's say we wanted to go to Earth orbit. Well, Earth orbit has a difficulty of three. So we have a mass of two. So three times two is six but we only have a thrust of four. So we can't actually go there. So what if we would have another Juno rocket? Then we would actually have eight thrust. Oh, what's happening? There we go. Then we would actually have eight thrust. So the problem now is that by buying another Juno rocket, we also have more mass. So now we have a mass of three, the difficulty is three, is three times three is nine, and we only have eight thrust. So still we can't go there because we made our rocket too heavy. So let's buy another Juno rocket. So now we have a mass of four, and the difficulty is three, and three times four is 12, and we have four plus four plus four is 12 thrust. So that's exactly enough. So then we could discard all these rockets, we could fire them, and then this spaceship would be going to Earth orbit. And then the probe is there, but it doesn't have anything else. So it just has to stay in Earth orbit until it maybe rendezvous with something or it just stays there. So those are very, very important mechanics. So we have weight, thrust, difficulty, 
And then we've got different components that have different amount of thrust. So the Juno rocket has 4, the Atlas has 27, the Soyuz has 80, and the Saturn has 200. Then there is an ion engine, which ion thruster, which I will go into at the end of this video because it's a bit more complicated. But uh, at least this here inherently kind of makes sense. However, the previous example left out a very, very important detail, and that is that you don't start with Juno rockets. You first have to be able to build them and to kind of research them until they're safe. Or well, you don't have to, but it's quite dangerous to not do it. So in order to be able to build Juno rockets, you first need the Juno rocket advancement. So you can buy this, and you can see in the left bottom, for $10 million. So you buy this, and then you basically get that card. However, when you get the card, you also put three outcome cards on it. And those will basically be determining for you how hard it will be to have a safe Juno rocket. So we shuffle these and then let's build a probe. So let's first spend 10 million. And then we want to build a probe. And you can see here the cost for a probe is two. So we spend five and we get three back. Perfect. Then we want to have some Juno rockets, and Juno rockets cost one apiece, so let's build three. Then we can give the three million back to the bank. And now we have a fully fledged spacecraft again, because as last time we calculated, here from Earth to suborbital is a difficulty of three, which is the same difficulty as from lunar orbit to Earth orbit. And with a mass of four, we need 12 thrusts, which we have at the moment. So let's start flying and see what happens. So to fly, we need to fire these rockets one by one. So let's fire one rocket. And there we go. And then we need to draw one of these outcome cards. So we will draw the top one. And it's a major failure. So this is really bad because as you can see here, a major failure at the bottom there says explosion destroys aircraft. So all of this is broken. However, we learned something now. We learned how to not build Juno rockets. So if we want to spend the money to actually research what happened here, we need to spend 5 million. And then we can get rid of this card. So now this card isn't in there anymore. Because if we didn't spend the 5 million, then the card would just go back here and then we would shuffle the deck and then we might draw it again at some point. But of course, major failure is not very nice to have. So it's always good to have some money before you start testing your stuff because of stuff like this. Okay, so let's say we then build ourselves a new spaceship. This would cost us 5 uh, in total, so we would spend 5. And then maybe next turn, we, when we have some more money again, we would fire this again. So then we would start again. We would fire one, we would shuffle this, we would draw one, and it's a success. Perfect. So we could now get rid of this success by spending 10 million. Why would you want to get rid of a success? Well, that has a quite a good reason. Because let's say this major failure was still in here. Next time, we, when we... If we wouldn't know that there was a major failure in there, we, we would just have drawn a success. We were like, okay, that's perfect. Then we just shuffle the deck again. We just take a card. Oh, it's a success again. We shuffle. Oh, it's a success again. So we start thinking that there is nothing but successes in this deck. And that can be very dangerous because maybe at some point you have a very expensive mission all the way to Mars and you're almost back and all your astronauts are almost having a party. And then you might accidentally draw this major failure and then your entire spaceship blows up and everyone dies and everyone is sad which would not be very nice so the reason why you might want to get rid of successes is the following let's say we already paid for this major failure here so we fired a juno rocket we spent 10 to remove this success which is quite expensive so we spent 10 let's say we would have 10 more and we would fire another juno rocket we turn this one around and it's another success. Perfect. Now we can actually get rid of this one for free because the last card, if it's a success, you can just get rid of for free. Otherwise you would just be turning around a success card all the time, which doesn't make any sense. So now we have automatic successes all the time. We have tested our spaceship to such a degree that nothing can ever go wrong again with Juno rockets. Like there's still all these other rockets to test and all landing and rendezvous, but at least Juno rockets are very reliable now. So this one is actually an automatic success. 
and now I have generated 12 thrusts and my rocket can go into suborbital uh, sub flight. So that is very important, researching your components. There is a uh, red exclamation mark here and that means that there is an automatic maneuver. So if you end your round here in this tile, then you automatically have to go to Earth. There's a couple of more of those things. For example, here in the lunar flyby, if you stay here and you don't have any power anymore to go anywhere else, then you are lost. You just fly away. You're not in orbit of any planet you know. You just go into deep space and be sad. So there's a couple of more of those, like here in inner planet transfer and here Mars flyby. So there's a couple of ways you can get lost. So you don't really want that to happen unless you're very sure that you can do a certain thing. For example, you could go into a lunar flyby because it's cheaper than going into lunar orbit and then try to survey the moon from a distance, but you only get one shot on doing it. And if you fail, then your probe will be lost. And that's a kind of an interesting, interesting uh, risk management. Once again, this game is all about risk management. All right, let's look at the other advancement cards. Let's start with life support. Life support says draw a random outcome when capsule ends a year in space. So let's say my setup was this at the moment. I've got this Vostok capsule here. I've got an Eagle capsule here and I've got a probe here. Then I would have to draw at the end of my year, I would have to draw two cards and I would do that uh, one by one. So first, let's say I would have three cards. Then I would say, okay, for this one, I'm going to draw a one. Okay, that's a success. Let's say I can't pay for it. Then I'm going to shuffle again. And then we will have to draw for the ego capsule. And that's also a success. Good. Then you can see what happens. If it's a success, everyone survives. If it's a ma minor failure, everyone dies. And if it's a major failure, everyone dies as well. So that is quite dangerous. Unless you have a um, mechanic, which is uh, these guys here with uh, the wrench as their icon, then you can see here that a minor failure will count as a success if you have a mechanic on board of the ship. All right, so every turn that, uh, or every year that a capsule ends in space, then you need to draw a card. I don't have to draw for my probe because not, it's not a capsule. So you can test your life support without having astronauts on board. And that's also really the way to do it because, well, otherwise you run the risk of losing your um, astronauts. And if they die, you will get a minus two points at the end of the game for each astronaut that dies. So you don't want them to die. So yeah, that's life support. Then we can look at re-entry and re-entry says draw a random outcome when heat shield faces a cloud. As you can see here, I am now in earth orbit and let's say I want to go to earth. Then you can see in the bottom here that there is a cloud. So if with this capsule here, I want to go to earth, it's a difficulty of zero. So I don't need any thrust, but I do need to test my re-entry because I have a heat shield. And uh, it says when I encounter a cloud, it burns up unless re-entry is successful. So unless I draw a success card, which I did, so re-entry is successful. If it's a major failure, uh, everything dies and everything is destroyed. If it's a minor failure, the capsule is damaged, but the occupants survive. If you don't have a heat shield, for example, a probe doesn't have a heat shield. This Eagle capsule doesn't have a heat shield. They will immediately die. Because, as you can see here, a cloud means burn up. So you do need a heat shield to go back to anything with the atmosphere. Also, for example, uh, Venus and uh, Mars. All right, so that is re-entry. Uh, let's look at the landing. So draw a random outcome when spacecraft faces the landing sin um, symbol. So let's say here I wanted to land on the moon. Then, as you can see here, I do need to draw a landing card because I'm landing on the moon. However, on Earth, it's between brackets. So that means that I can choose to do it if I want to. So let's say this Vostok would go here. Oh, Then I would first draw a re-entry card. And then I could, if I wanted to, draw a landing card just to test my landing. You don't have to do that, but it's never a bad idea to just send some capsules into space and let them land just to test your landing gear because if it's um, a minor failure, then 
something will get damaged. If it's a major failure, then everything dies. However, if you have a pilot, uh, a major failure will count as a minor failure and the minor failure will um, count as a success. All right, let's look at rendezvous. Rendezvous is a very interesting mechanic. Let's say I have this spacecraft here and it wants to rendezvous with this Vostok. Well, I can do that by first going there and the difficulty is three and my weight is one, two, three, four, four, five, six, seven, times three is 21, and I have 27 thrusts, so that's fine. So I'm gonna get rid of this Atlas rocket. Then I'm in the same space. Now, what I want to do is basically, I want to go back to Earth with this astronaut. The problem is this eagle will burn up in the atmosphere. It doesn't have a heat shield. So I have to somehow put this astronaut into the Vostok capsule. So to do that, I do a rendezvous. So I draw an outcome card, it's a success, perfect. So now I can merge these two spacecraft. There, and this one is gone. Now, I could already go back, but it would be a bit of a waste because then this capsule would uh, go to waste. What I now can do is I can also separate, as you can see here, rendezvous, draw random outcome when docking or separating. So I could separate this into different parts. So then I could make a new spacecraft. So we could put this back into an ego capsule and some supplies because next time I might send an, as an astronaut back into space and then at least it has some supplies. And then I can go back to earth with this one because it has a heat shield and I can do the, the re-entry, I can do the landing if I want to and then my astronaut is back on earth very happy. So that's rendezvous. You can either combine ships or you can separate them and both of them need you to draw a card. Before we go into surveying, we need to talk about exploration and how it works. You can explore all the unexplored tiles. Here you can see suborbital flight, Moon, uh, Venus, Ceres, Phobos, Mars, as well as solar radiation and Mercury in the expansion. And the way you do that is basically having a working capsule or probe there. Then once you survive all the hazards, in this case only landing, if I land there successfully, then I get to explore the Moon. So how I do that is basically I turn it around and I look at it. And this one says spacecraft destroyed by vast oceans of dust. Ooh, that's not very nice at all. So now my probe dies. However, you could also not go there in person. So let's say I would still be here. Then I could survey it from a distance and surveying works the following. When you are in a location that has access to an unexplored location, and in this case that would be lunar flyby because it points at the moon, or lunar orbit because it also points at the moon. From one of these locations, I could then say I would want to survey the moon, and then I draw a survey card, and if it's a success, then I can explore this. So that's basically surveying, and then I would have had uh, this mission, reveal moon location, lunar survey. So then I would have uh, actually succeeded in that mission by surveying it from a distance. Um, this works a little bit different in a multiplayer game, but I will go into that in the end of this video. There is two exceptions on this exploring rule. Suborbital flight can only be explored by a manned capsule. So you cannot do it with a probe, you have to do it with a capsule with an astronaut in it and then you get to explore this. Then there is solar radiation. Let's say I want to go from Earth orbit to Mars orbit. Then that will cost me some time in which we'll go later, but also I will have to look at the solar radiation tile and there's no significant radiation. That means that from now on, never, every time I have to look at the exploration tile, never there will be significant radiation because I will randomize these at the beginning of the game. In another game it might be very dangerous and your astronauts can get inca incapacitated and it's very good to bring a doctor on board and so on. So those are, the, those are the two exceptions. All right, lastly there are the ion thrusters, but before we go into them we need to go into the concept of time because that's how they work. So let's say I'm here and I want to go to inner planet transfer. Well, we can see here that it costs one year. And the way that works is first, I need to spend the thrust to go there and it is a difficulty of three. I have a weight of four, three times four is 12 and these give four per piece. So that's 12 thrust, so that's enough. I get rid of these rockets and then I can go here. However, it costs me a year to fly there because of the one hourglass. So I put an hourglass on there and at the end of the year, I remove the hourglass, hourglass, which means that next year I can do maneuvers again. 
So that is how time works. If, for example, I wanted to go to Mars orbit, that would cost me two years, which would mean I would put go here, I would put two hourglasses on this. At the end of the year, I would remove this hourglass, and then this can't do anything at all for another year, and then I remove this hourglass, and then I can start maneuvering again. That's how time works. Now, there are a couple of things that you should know about ion thrusters. Ion thrusters, as you can see here, they produce five thrust per year, per hourglass. Now, let's say I wanted to go from Earth orbit to inner planet transfer. Inner planet transfer has a difficulty of three and it cost me one year. Well, if I spend one year, I get five thrust. Five times three, um, sorry, three difficulty times two weight is six. And this one only gives me five thrusts, so that's not enough. Now, the fun part is, with the ion thruster, you can just say, okay, I'm going to spend an extra year to thrust. So basically, I could move this here. Normally, that would cost me one time, but because I say, well, I'm just going to thrust two year for 10 thrust, and then I can bring the probe there. And I put another time on it. So basically, with the ion thruster, you can spend as much time as you want to go around um, the universe and that's quite nice because you don't discard these, you can keep using them forever. Of course, you have to research them just like any other component or maneuver, but they give basically infinite thrust as long as you have infinite time. Now, there is a bit of a problem though. They are very, very weak. So locations that don't give you an option to use time, for example, let's say I want to go to lunar orbit from the moon, I cannot do that with the ion thruster because there is not an option to spend time. That means the gravity of the moon is much too high for my ion thruster to work, so I cannot actually use my ion thruster to go there. The same happens from Earth, for example. I cannot use ion thrusters to get into orbit because of the gravity. Afterwards, I can start using them because there's all these time things. Now, there's also some things which have brackets. So here, Earth orbit has a bracket and time. That means that normally it doesn't cost any time whatsoever, but if I use ion thrusters, I can, I can use them for that. It's fine, I can go there and put a time on it. However, if I would just use normal rockets, then it wouldn't cost me time. While things without brackets, they always cost time, even if you just use rockets. What this also means is that something that might not be entirely clear from the beginning is that you can go from Earth to Earth orbit, to lunar orbit, to the moon, back, back, and back, all in one year, because none of them necessarily cost time. So you can do that all in the span of one, one year, while doing other things that actually require you to spend time, you have to spend multiple years on those things. Now you basically know all the rules of the game. Basically, you get as many turns as you want within a year. As I said, you can go to the moon and back, you can build rockets, you can test them, but each year you only get 25 million. So that very much restricts what you can do. Let's say I would spend 10 million this year, then I don't get 25 again next year, I just get 20 because I didn't use my budget entirely. The government is like, well, apparently they don't need as much, let's give them less. So basically you just get 25 million every year to spend. At the end of the year, you bring the counter further and then in the end you flip this and in that way you go to 1976 because this only goes to 65. Now, there are still a couple of things. At the end of the year, for every astronaut that is in space, so let's say we are here, we have a capsule and we've got an astronaut there, astronauts will consume supplies. So you can bring supplies on board, but they cost quite a lot of weight. Each supply can feed five astronauts, but if you only have one astronaut, it will still consume the entire supply for that year. If you don't have supplies, the astronauts will die. So it's very good to bring supplies with you. You can also, for example, make a space station with supplies and then just have it orbit and once in a while pick them up or whatever you want to do. There's a lot of freedom in how you want to do things. Then there are samples. For example, I have a mission Phobos sample on Earth, which means that I have to go to Phobos. Then I can basically just take a Phobos sample, put it on my rocket. You don't need to spend time or anything on this, but it costs an extra weight. So you have to take that into account. That's how sampling works. 
Lastly, let's talk about the differences between the solo game and the multiplayer game. In the solo game, you basically want to get as many points as possible and you win the game if you have more than half of the points that are available. So here we have 24, 29, 31, 35, 39 points. So if we have more than half, so that's 20 points, let's say I would have this and this and this, then I would win the solo game if I do that within this time. In the multiplayer game, you basically win when you have more points than others and others cannot get more than you anymore. So let's say I would have these two, I have 24, the other players could never get more than my 24 points, so then I would win the game. Now, in the multiplayer game, exploration works a little bit differently. If I survey a location, so I'm far away, and I say I'm gonna survey the moon, then I can look at it myself and then I can decide whether I want to show it to others or not, whether I'm going to share the intelligence with the other players or not. So that is completely up to you. However, if you now would explore this, and so not surveying, but actually explore it, you could look at it yourself as well. And then you can decide whether you want to show it to other people or not. But if you don't show it, you have to destroy your spaceship that's there. So that's kind of like a penalty in a sense for not sharing the intelligence to other people. Here, in this case, you could say it doesn't matter because it just says spacecraft destroyed by vast ocean of dust. My spacecraft would already be destroyed. Now, I can say I'm not going to share that information with others. I'm just going to destroy this. And then people might think, hmm, maybe he has something to hide. Maybe he found life on Earth, on the moon, but he didn't have the equipment to bring it back or whatever. So that's why he didn't share the intelligence. And then they might just waste their time trying to go to the moon, even though it's very lethal there. So you can kind of gain this a little bit, like trying to bluff to see if there's something interesting there or not. That's how exploration works in a multiplayer game. But there's also lots of cooperation. During your turn, you can cooperate with other space agencies. Basically, you can share research. So let's say I have Atlas rockets with two outcomes on it because I've already tested it once. Then I could share that with someone else and they would for free also get Atlas rockets with two outcomes on it because that's how far I tested it. If I had no outcome cards on it, they would get a perfect Atlas rocket from me. They could either get it for free or you can haggle a little bit like, hey, if you give me five or 10 million, then you get a completely perfectly uh, tested Atlas rocket. Another thing you can do is you can give components to other people. And that's a very interesting thing to do because basically, let's say you have very well tested rockets. You could say, well, you want to launch a satellite into orbit but I have the rockets, so how about you give me your satellite as well as, let's say, 10 million, and then I will launch it into Earth orbit, and then you will get your satellite back as one of your own spaceships. So then you can just rendezvous, you can separate it, and you can give it back to them. So you can kind of make all these deals to kind of work together, but you're still very much in competition in order to get the first to all these goals. The very last thing I want to pay some attention to is the cheat sheet here. It's very, very handy on planning your maneuvers because last time, for example, we did it completely manually. We said, okay, we want to go from Earth orbit to lunar orbit. We have a weight of four. Um, the difficulty is three, which is 12. Then with three Juno rockets, we have 12 as well. So that's fine. You can do that a bit easier. You can just look at the payload and the payload is kind of what the rockets are transporting. So that's one ton, it's a probe. So we can go here and the difficulty is three. So we can see that the payload for one Juno rocket for difficulty three is one third. So that would mean we need three, right? I could also just put an Atlas there and that actually can transport a payload of five for a difficulty of three. So that would mean I can, for example, add like four supplies or whatever I would want to do. And then one Atlas rocket would be enough. All right, so that's what this thing does. You basically just look at the payload, how heavy is the stuff that I want to transport, and then look at how much thrust you need and which rockets would be best. You can combine them in any way you want. Let's say I need 10 thrust and a difficulty of two. I could use one Atlas and one Juno to get to 10. Now, the other one is for ion thrusters. And ion thrusters, well, we already saw that they're quite interesting, but let's say I want to go from Earth orbit to lunar orbit, then that's a difficulty of three, the payload is one, difficulty of three, 
then if I would only spend one year, I would only have two thirds of a ton of thrust, which is not enough. So I need to spend two years because then I have enough thrust to, well, bring the payload to lunar orbit. So that's how you can use this cheat sheet. So I will make another video basically with some examples of how I would solve a certain problem um, to basically give a couple of more examples to make more clear how this game works and how it's fun. But yeah, this is how you play Leaving Earth. I hope you found this video useful and see you next time.